Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The secret is out. I am Pete Wilson. <laughs> it's a secret to a lot of people, though. It is my great privilege to serve as one of the members of the Board of Trustees for this institution, this teaching institution, because that's what it is. It exists to fulfill a mission, I think, of critical importance to the future of this nation. It is not just to remind, but to preserve the legacy, the legacy of Ronald Reagan, who I think most of us in this audience would agree is one of the greatest presidents in the history of this nation. And there are different ways to work at fulfilling that mission. Our guest tonight, our extraordinarily gifted guest, has many ways in which to do it. But I'm getting ahead of myself, but not by much. Michael Ramirez is the extraordinarily gifted and talented editorial cartoonist of the Investor's Business Daily. But I'm going to get into that with a little greater depth. Because before I do, it is my privilege to introduce to you the members of his distinguished family. And let me tell you why I'm doing that. I asked him if I might have that privilege. And it is because they are individually and as a family people that Ronald Reagan would have not only understood but greatly admired. And I'm only saddened that he didn't have the chance to meet them and that they didn't have the chance to meet him because they are a great American success, success story. They, Michael is the grandson of immigrants. So am I. So I suspect are many of you and probably some more recently arrived than second generation, probably many that are first, and I hope and would bet that there are naturalized citizens sitting in this audience tonight. Well, let me begin by telling you why he is so justifiably proud of his family. First of all, his paternal grandfather was born in Mexico, his paternal grandmother in Spain. He hastened to add they were legal immigrants to California. <laughs> and his grandparents on his mother's side were from Japan. First of all, about his father. His father, Edward, was born in East Los Angeles. He was in Army intelligence for 23 years. He served in both Korea and in Vietnam. He was assigned to Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe, SHAPE, and to NATO. And according to Michael, as if he had not demonstrated that by his service, he loved America and believed that it was a place where dreams come true. And that is his belief and mine as well. With the proviso that you take your God-given gifts and then work like hell to be the best that you can be. I'm an old Marine. The Marine is not apparent. The old is obvious. <laughs> but I will say to you that I have great respect for the US Army. And they've got a great slogan, be all that you can be. That's really should be the American slogan. His mother, who is with us this evening, Fumiko, Fumiko Ramirez, had the tough job. <laughs> While her husband was overseas so much of the time, she had the job of raising five children. And according to her son, Michael, she instilled the conservative values 
of the Japanese culture, the self-discipline, the sense of responsibility, and the quaint notion that everything that you do as an individual reflects upon the other members of your family. Now, we move to the next generation. Mike's siblings, the oldest, Dr. Edward Ramirez, gynecologist and fertility specialist, is also a colonel in the United States Army Reserve. And his daughter, Julia, whom I understand is with us tonight, is a, was a UCI undergraduate and then graduated from Stanford Medical School. As I believe did her father, and then Dr. Victoria Ramirez, a specialist in internal medicine, graduated from UCI as an undergraduate in the Hanneman Medical School. And she and her husband, Dr. Denley Jang, also a specialist in internal medicine, and her daughter, Alexandra, are here with us tonight. Dr. Alexander Ramirez, the youngest of Mike's siblings, is an ear, nose, and throes facial plastic surgeon, graduated top of his class from Stanford and top of his class from the University of California School of Medicine, the UCSF School. It is terrific. And he will be here tonight with his doc, with, I almost said with his doctor. <laughs> with, with his wife, Dr. Lori Ramirez, a dermatologist, and two children, Kea and Ellie, who probably by this time have concluded that it's a nice family, but it's too bad that they have no choice in terms of occupation. <laughs> Finally, Elizabeth Contreras graduated from Stanford. As an undergrad, she was at Stanford and then graduated from the USC School of Medicine. And then she became pregnant and chose to be a mom a stay-at-home mom. And Dr. Her, her husband, Dr. Brian Con Contreras, is a gastroenterologist. And her two children are Bryson and Emily. Bryson, I understand, will be with us tonight. Again, I don't know if he's old enough to have chosen a career, but <laughs> the pressure's on the kid if not. This is an extraordinary family with the father, an army intelligence specialist who made certain that his children lived by a code that was supportive but demanding. He demanded that they demand from themselves the best, the best that they had to give to their chosen profession, to the country in which it was possible for people to seize opportunity and by hard work to make a remarkable contribution. Well, I don't blame Mike Ramirez for being proud of his family. We should all be proud of his family. I wonder if I could ask all of the members of his family who are present to stand. Thank you. And I won't ask her to stand, but my wife, Gail, who puts up with a great deal, is sitting right here. And Uh, I do have to say that uh, I wish Ronald Reagan were here in person, not simply in spirit, because he would enjoy witnessing what I have just told you, and he would 
have told it better, <laughs> but he would have felt very much at home with an evening in which we honor the one black sheep in the family, <laughs> the only non-doctor, and I must say that he chose an extraordinary art form. I chose a primitive one, politics, <laughs> very primitive, and even when I did it, not to mention what it's become. But before we begin tonight, let me just tell you a little bit about him, although this crowd coming out in this rain tells me that you already know a great deal. The first thing that you probably know is that he is a supremely gifted cartoonist. He is a very funny man, but he is an editorial cartoonist, which means that there is a point to all of his cartoons. They do make you laugh. They make me laugh. I'm not sure they make everyone laugh. <laughs> the targets, I suspect, don't laugh much. But what he learned a long time ago is that along with his gifts, the art form that he had chosen is one that permitted him to draw pictures that evoked irony, wit, satire, outrage, and when the occasion warrants it, sympathy, admiration, and great emotions. And he is sufficiently gifted so that he never fails to do that. I've never seen a Ramirez cartoon that didn't not only make a point, but did so with a clear purpose in mind. And it's just as though the man knew that he were speaking for so many of us who don't have the same talent, don't have the same audience or the same opportunity. Once again, this is in the Ramirez tradition of seizing the opportunity. Well, by doing so, he has offered a unique perspective on today's issues. And for Mike Ramirez, no issues are off the table. Whether it is the Iran nuclear deal or North Korea's saber rattling with missiles, whether it is the $19 billion trillion, excuse me. Thank you. See, now this is a good audience. Three of them corrected me already. <laughs> trillion dollar debt or Hillary Clinton <laughs> or Donald Trump or as, as recently as yesterday, a very poignant cartoon showing the Statue of Liberty looking at a headline mourning the loss of the great Justice Antonin Scalia and holding down the torch of freedom that where the light has gone out temporarily. Um, this is what I mean when I say that he has the ability to evoke emotions and evoke emotions for those of us who welcome his doing so. So his illustrations are becoming a part of our culture. I hope an endless and greater part. He is, uh, he's extraordinary. We are dear friends. And he did me the honor of asking if I would provide a sentence on the first book that he put out of his cartoons. And I did, I said, many people who are cartoonists are talented. But this man produces these wonderful drawings that are laugh out loud funny, but that have the intellectual impact, the impact and the precision accuracy of a high explosive guided missile. That's why not all of the targets laugh, or very many of them, 
Any that do have earned my admiration. They at least have a sense of humor. Well, enough of this because, as you heard, a picture is worth 10,000 words. One of his is worth God knows how much. <laughs> and you've had enough of mine. So come up here, Mr. Ramirez, with your talent, your love of America. Go get him, pal. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, I cannot tell you how much of an honor it is to have my dear friends, uh, Governor Wilson and, and, and Gail Wilson here. Uh, they represent, to me, in politics, what America needs, kind of substantial uh, depth and purity of heart and a real love for liberty. You know, I, I, I kind of wish that I invited more of my relatives. That way I could limit my speech down to about three, <laughs> three minutes. I am, the, I am the black sheep of the family, and uh, you know, they don't even let me in the family reunions, except I, I figured out a device. I, I tell them, well, you know, since I deal with Congress on a, on a daily basis, I'm sort of like a proctologist, so they, they let me in. <laughs> you know, um, there was this young man, and he was on trial, and the judge was chastising him. He was saying, how could you possibly justify such a terrible deed, killing a California condor. There are, only 27, well, there are only 26 of them left in the wild. What could possibly have been going through your mind to allow you to do such a terrible, terrible deed? And, he, and, and the men said to the, the judge, Your Honor, I was, I was lost in the wilderness. I was camping. And, and, uh, and I, I wandered through some brush, and I fell off a cliff, and I landed on a ledge. I was stuck on this ledge for seven days and seven nights with no food, no water, and I must look pretty bad because as I laid there, this giant buzzard landed on top of me and started pecking on me. So with the last ounce of strength in my body, I picked up a rock, I bashed him in the skull, and I ate him. It was a, a matter of survival. It was sustenance. The judge said, well, you know, that's, that's a pretty good reason. I may just let you off. Just, just out of curiosity, what did it taste like? And he said, well, it was kind of a cross between a bald eagle and a spotted owl. <laughs> a story with a twist, an element of humor to capture your attention, and then the fatal blow. And in essence, that is editorial cartoony. You know, when, when people ask me, you know, what is an editorial cartoonist, I always say, you know, we're kind of a hybrid. We're a cross between Edward R. Murrow, Ted Koppel, and the son of Sam. <laughs> editorial cartoons are about concept. The illustration is merely a vehicle to convey a point of view. We're here to protect and inform the public, to attack and repel those who do not share our long-term philosophical interests. You know, I believe in editorial cartooning as journalism. Basically, you know, you can say I get paid to be obnoxious. It's the only other profession besides dentistry where they get paid to be obnoxious. Now, uh, some, some politicians will tell you that they're paid to be obnoxious. They're not paid to be, they're just obnoxious. That's why we have editorial cartoonists. But it is a profession about ideas. 95% of what I do is concept or pushing a particular point of view. We are the pit bulls of journalism, and we're trained to attack at the slightest provocation. We are the prosecution, pushing for a rapid conviction and an immediate execution. We are the defense, punching holes in the arguments raised against our cause. We are judge and we are jury. And since uh, I'm not on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, my judgments actually make sense. <laughs> now, we stand in judgment over the issues, and the sentence that we levy is swift and harsh. Now, in order to do that, you know, clearly, you have to read and research to digest the complex issues and bring some semblance of order to them. So, you know, I have a very boring job for most people. I get paid to read. Um, I start the day at around 5 or 5.30 every morning. You know, I'm the editorial cartoonist for Investors Business Daily, which is the best newspaper in the entire world, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm also the co-manager of the editorial page. So in preparation for our 8 to 10, every morning editorial meetings. I get up around 5 or 5.30 and I watch the news at every half hour to sort of see what's on the, uh, 
what's being absorbed by the American consciousness. I read four papers a day. Um, you know, I read the LA Times. I read the uh, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, and of course, did I mention Investors Business Daily, which is the greatest <laughs> newspaper in the world. Some, some people say the truth lies somewhere between the editorial pages of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. The truth lies in the editorial pages of Investors Business Daily. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a political analyst. I'm a political wonk. I read everything I can get my hands on. You know, I'm, as a contributor to the Weekly Standard, of course, I read the Weekly Standard and, and the National Review. I'll, I'll, if I want a good laugh, I'll read Mother Jones or watch MSNBC. But I think it's important to view the issues on the broadest possible reference plane. In fact, if you firmly believe in any issue, I urge you to read the opposite. Most times, I think it's going to merely reinforce your original beliefs. But on the rare occasion, I think it may change your mind. Either way, I think you'll have a much larger and more comprehensive view of the issue. You see, in a democratic republic, it is the constituents' responsibility to be informed. Our founding fathers knew that liberty and freedom are precious, but you have to have knowledge to be able to ascertain the values of our system. I believe it's important to understand all sides of an issue, and that entails knowing the contrary point of view. I'm a big believer in, in the statement, know thine enemy. And I've become very familiar with the Obama administration in the process. <laughs> Editorial cartoonists, we spend our time gathering information. We process the information to draw a conclusion, to draw a cartoon, and hopefully to draw blood. Now, unfortunately, the modern trend in political cartooning has been to, to make simple jokes about current affairs. I think humor without a substantive statement diminishes the importance of the editorial cartoon. Uh, an editorial cartoon is not just a funny picture. A good editorial cartoon is a fine instrument of journalism. At times, it's sharp and refined, cutting quickly to the point. At times, blunt, with its dark imagery seizing the reader's attention. And as with any editorial, the cartoon has a point. That's the most important element. It tells a story. It defines an issue. It challenges hypocrisy. It reveals the best and the worst of humanity. It calls the reader to arms against the complacent, the lethargic, the evildoers, the indolent body politic, and the champions of the status quo. It exposes the assorted predators of society. And by that, I mean Congress. But a good editorial cartoon is, is not only well-researched, it should be carefully contemplated. For instance, take the death of Johnny Cochran. He was most well-known for being the lead in the defense team of O.J. Simpson. He got a murderer off. The first image that immediately came to mind when I heard of Johnny's death was that uh, having Johnny at the gates of heaven with St. Peter saying, if the halo don't fit, we don't admit. Now, it was a pretty straightforward cartoon. Johnny Cochran did get a murderer off. But, you know, upon a closer examination of Johnny Cochran and his entire career, it revealed a generous man who engaged in many charitable events, many charitable causes. And it seemed unfair to define him with one single issue. So I never drew the cartoon. Another example is a space shuttle challenger. You know, there's a lot of uh, stories surrounding the event, saying that the NASA's efforts to curb spending and cutting corners had created safety concerns. So the first image that came to mind was having these pieces of the shuttle sprayed across the sky, and a bubble coming out of one of the little pieces saying, man, these NASA cutbacks are killing us. A very powerful image. But seven American heroes died. And the controversy surrounding the career would overshadow the point I'm trying to make. You know, an editorial cartoon isn't humorous for the sake of humor, as it's not controversial for the sake of controversy. It's neither conservative nor liberal. Whether you agree with it philosophically or not, a good editorial cartoon engages the reader in debate. It informs and it challenges. It draws the reader into the democratic process. It is the catalyst for thought. You see, editorial cartoons should do more than offend. But the right to offend, I think, must be thoroughly defended. In the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson wrote, 
We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But while these rights are indeed endowed by a creator and guaranteed by our constitution, it is government that upholds these liberties, and it is men who constitute the government. And there are some of those out there who believe the Constitution is merely a starting point for negotiation. James Madison wrote, I believe there are more instances of the abridgment of freedom of the people by gradual and silent encroachments by those in power than by violent and sudden usurpations. Journalism, editorial cartoons are a check to the erosion of, of our liberties. And part of the first line of defense to the advance of the unrestrained power of government. One good editorial cartoon can have a significant impact on the political dialogue of the day. And if done well, it can influence those who govern to govern responsibly and expose them when they do not. Einstein once said, two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity. And I'm not sure about the universe. Einstein was right. It's this axiom that makes political cartooning important. The people who ultimately govern will make mistakes. They're human after all, or most of them are human. But history has demonstrated that power can turn leaders into monsters. Editorial cartoonists will gladly point out the shortcomings of the powerful in an effort to keep them human. There's a reason our founding fathers included the right to a free press in the First Amendment of our Constitution. Information is a necessary component to guide you in a political system based on self-governance and individual liberty. Information is power. Imagine if you knew about this, this little computer company back in December 12, 1980, on its initial public offering of $22 a share those shares of Apple Computer would be worth $450,000 today. Thomas Jefferson wrote, our liberty depends on the freedom of the press, and that cannot be limited without it being lost. The reason our founding fathers included the right to a free press in our Constitution was because they knew the communication of ideas and information, the right to be informed, the right to inform, the dissemination of ideas and the expression of opinion are all necessary components in a political system based on self-governance and individual liberty. A free press is a check on government power. It's the daylight in the dark arena of politics. It provides the voter with information to decide their own future. But you know what? The press has to do its job. It's most important now with, when dealing with this presidency and the failures of its policies. Unfortunately, the only people that, that are more incompetent than this administration is the Washington Press Corps. You know, a reporter's job is to be the purveyor of fact, to point out the injustices of the world, and to shine the hot spotlight of exposure, to wound the perpetrators of those injustices with the truth. Editorial cartoonists, we just go back and shoot the wounded. And the mainstream media no longer serves the public by delivering objective coverage. They've become the propaganda arm of a political party. I think there's widespread manipulation going on in the media. The mainstream media has been perpetuating a lot of myths and serving their own political agenda. Now, I, I find it funny that uh, America is praising Donald Trump for being blunt and uh, politically incorrect. <laughs> That's something I've been doing for the last 32 years. <laughs> but it brings me to my book. You know, my book is about the uh, devastating results of uh, the disastrous po uh, progressive agenda. I start off the introduction uh, this way. The Peter Principle is when, the, when a person is elevated to their level of incompetence. The Obama Principle is when that person becomes president of the United States. <laughs> You know, I'm an equal opportunity uh, offender, but with this administration, editorial cartooning is more like stenography than, than a creative process. <laughs> when people ask me, how do you come up with your ideas, I always joke, I have the best gag writer in the world working for me in the Oval Office every day. 
when he's not on vacation or out uh, golfing. This, this administration has just been a joy for me, not so much for you, I'm sure. This president had a big flaw. He had a pathological addiction to prevarication. This flaw, I think, however, turned out to be relatively minor compared to the size of his ego. A actually, everything is small compared to the size of his ego. And the oversized ego and those pathological lies quickly became an abundance of cartoon ideas. And don't forget, when Barack Obama became president, he was a president with a majority in the House and a supermajority in the Senate, and the power to implement his vision. That was the problem. He was never a centrist. His centrism was a fable conjured up by his campaign and repeated ad nauseum by complicit media. That was the problem. For those of us who were paying attention, we knew there was never anything moderate about Barack Obama. He was a left-wing, far-left uh, politician with a far-left agenda. His real vision for America was its radical transformation. I like to compare the first step, like uh, limbo, the first cir circle of Dante's hell. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. There was no hope. It was all about change. You see, President Obama believes that government is not the problem. He believes it's the solution. He believes our enemies are not bad. He believes they're simply misunderstood. He believes that corporations create inequality, not jobs. He sees America as a land of plenty. But in President Obama's mind, that's a bad thing. In Obama's world, America is a land of excess, of immoderate indulgences, of intemperance, gluttony with a lack of restraint and a rapacious appetite for everything. You see, in Obama's world, American capitalism is responsible for the subjugation of the worker. American consumption is responsible for creating ecological destruction and global warming. American greed is responsible for creating the poor. American ingenuity is responsible for the exploitation of the masses. American exceptionalism is the reason for global hostility against America. President Obama believes, to borrow a phrase from Walt Kelly, that we've met the enemy, he is us. And that's why the media loves him, because they agree with him. You know, I like to quote Einstein. Einstein once said, intellectuals solve problems. Geniuses prevent them. Obama creates them. <laughs> Remember uh, Obama's chief of, chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, said, you never want a serious crisis to go waste. You know, taking those words to heart, this administration has spent two terms creating crisis after crisis. Let's examine his record. Obama's foreign policy is a disaster. I think he's possibly the worst negotiator we've ever had. His policy of appeasement and leading from behind has diminished our global reputation, alienated our allies, and emboldened our enemies. Islamic extremism and the prospect of terrorism in our post 9-11 world continues to expand. Radical Islamic groups control more territory than ever. And now Iran controls Lebanon, Syria, Yemen, and Iraq. Worse, Iran has grown closer to, de to developing a nuclear weapon and starting a nuclear arms race in a region that's awash in oil but lacking reverence for human life. You know, mutually assured destruction is a policy that only works as a deterrent to those who are unwilling to die for their cause. China has begun to flex its muscles and threaten its neighbors. Russia has invaded hers. Under President Obama, the world has become a more dangerous place, particularly for Americans. The architecture of policy, the setting of artificial timetables, the micromanagement and premature conclusion of the wars in both Iraq and Afghanistan were designed by the Obama, Obama administration not for, well, they're designed for political advantage, not for strategic victory. And relinquishing those countries to terrorists, releasing terrorists from Gitmo while putting US troops in harm's way, giving Cuba to communists, all this was in the president's mind a small price to pay, to pay in order to fulfill his political promises. But Obama could pro proclaim mission accomplished. And of course he did, over and over again. 
Because in President Obama's mind, the mission was accomplished in the perfect sense. Because President Obama, to President Obama, the threat was not external, it was internal. America was the threat. America is the enemy. And Obama is at war with America. According to the president, American exceptionalism is the disease. And Obamacare was just the first step toward a cure. Saul Alinsky's third rule of ethics of means and ends and rules for radicals is that in war, the end justifies almost any means. And the president meant to put an end to American exceptionalism, and he's doing a pretty good job. The Obama green economy was in 2012 called the worst economic recovery in American history. Under Obamanomics, the national debt has increased seven, well, 8.4 trillion in just six years. Our national debt is now over $19 trillion, six times, more than six times the annual federal revenue. If we pass the president's budget, we would be closer to $20 trillion in debt, if you can imagine that. And now spending caps have been removed, so we're, we'll get there pretty quickly. U.S. household medium income level dropped 12% in the six years between 2007 and 2013. By 2013, incomes had dropped twice as much during the recovery than during the recession, more than 48 million Americans are living in poverty, including one in five young adults. 65% of children living in households receive one or more forms of federal aid. 46.4 million Americans are receiving food stamps. The labor participation rate is at the lowest rate since 1976. And the U6 unemployment rate is around 11.5%. During the Obama administration, we witnessed the first ever credit downgrade in U.S. history in 2011. During the Obama administration, we witnessed a second ever credit downgrade in U.S. history in 2012. We've seen a dramatic increase in income inequality. Black and minority families have been hit the worst. The wealth of white households was 13 times the median wealth of blacks in 2013, which is seven times greater <clears throat> than in 2010. The root cause of this, I believe, has been the substantial growth in government regulations, subsidies, and programs under this administration. And now they want everyone to have free college. Never mind that we have $128 trillion in unfunded liabilities from entitlements. You know, Alexis de Tocqueville once said, the American Republic will endure until the day Congress discovers that it can bribe the people with their own money. And while the list of economic failures to date is long, the president's list of excuses are even longer. <clears throat> I could go through all of them, but it would take 30 or 40 minutes. Um, and the only thing that's longer than that is the list of scandals by this administration. Any one of those scandals would have crippled the Republican administration and sent scores of investigated teams of journalists in pursuit of a Pulitzer Prize. And maybe, it just may be the truth. But the press continues to ignore them largely because they agree with the, the administration's political agenda. And I think that's a shame. It's a national disgrace. <clears throat> it's a national disgrace that these stories have not been covered at all. Newspapers and the media have an obligation to give the readers the truth, not a filtered version of the truth, not a politically correct version of the truth, but simply the truth. We are all human beings, and most journalists are as well. Therefore, they'll undoubtedly have their own interpretation of events. But that's what makes it so important to cover an issue in its entirety. Let me, uh, differing perceptions can easily color an issue. Let me give you an example. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson went uh, out on a camping trip. As they lay down to sleep, Holmes turned to Watson. He said, Watson, look up into the sky and tell me what you see. And Watson thought about it for a minute, and he said, well, I see millions and millions of stars. <clears throat> and Holmes said, what does that tell you? And Watson thought about it for a minute, and he said, well, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Theologically, it tells me that uh, there must be a God to create something as beautiful as this. And God is great, and we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, since it's such a beautiful, clear evening sky, it's probably going to be a beautiful day tomorrow. 
But then Watson turned to Holmes and he said, what does it tell you? And Holmes looked up and he said, somebody stole our tent. <laughs> We have a participatory democratic republic. The best system of governance in the world. Truly a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. But only if you, the people, participate. Now, I have, I have to tell this next joke because I, I love this joke. There's this duck. I walked into the store and went up to the manager <clears throat> and said, uh, got any grapes? And the manager looked at the duck and he said, uh, no, I don't have grapes. The duck said, oh, and walked out. Ten minutes later, this duck comes waddling into the store, goes up to the manager and says, uh, got any grapes? The manager looks at the duck and he says, no, I have no grapes. The duck goes, oh, walks out. Ten minutes later, this duck comes waddling up to the manager and says, got any grapes? The manager says, what's wrong with you? I have no grapes. I have no fruit section. I will never have grapes. The duck goes, oh, walks out. Ten minutes later, the duck comes waddling in, goes up to the manager and says, Got any grapes? The manager goes, look, I don't have grapes. I don't like grapes. I don't like ducks. Get out of my store. Duck goes, oh, walks out. Ten minutes later, the duck comes waddling in, goes up to the manager. The manager goes, hold it right there, duck. If you ask me for grapes one more time, I'm going to nail your little web feet to the floor. Ask me for anything else, but don't ask me for grapes. And the duck looks at him and says, um, got any nails? He says, no. Got any grapes? <laughs> See, this joke provides a good working analogy of how I view Washington bureaucracies at work. You see, because in Washington, D.C., things are not always represented as they truly are. For example, a slower increase in Medicare payments is not called a rational effort to save Medicare. It's called a draconian cut. A balanced budget amendment which stipulates that Congress can only spend the amount of revenue they take in is not called common sense. It's called extremism. Making illegal immigration illegal is not called following the law, it's called insensitivity. <laughs> Judging someone not by the content of their character, but strictly by the color of their skin, it's not called racism, it's called affirmative action. Aborting a human fetus in its third trimester is not called killing, it's called a choice. And when governments have a surplus, it doesn't mean we pay too much in taxes, it means that we've spent too little in services. And a tax is no longer called a tax, it's called an investment in America, or, or uh, I think Pres uh, Vice President Biden called it patriotism. <laughs> there is no global war on terror. It's called overseas contingency operation. The Ford Ho Hood attack was called workplace violence. They called the Muslim Brotherhood a largely secular group, which is as chewed violence. The Muslim Brotherhood, secular. It has the word Muslim in its name. <laughs> the Islamic State is neither Islamic or a state. They won't use the word radical Islam or Islamic extremists. And blowing up buildings is no longer called terrorism. It's called a man-caused disaster. Frankly, I think this administration has been a man-caused disaster. I don't know about you, but I believe in the old adage, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, it's usually a duck. My job as an editorial cartoonist is to nail that duck to the floor. <laughs> because someone needs to watch over the institution for the intellectually challenged, excuse me, the Obama administration, on behalf of the American public. Politicians often forget who they work for. Because of the pomp and circumstance that surrounds these career political celebrities, we're lulled into thinking, it is we who work for them. It is the opposite. It is they who work for you. They are public servants. They're elected to do your bidding. You should never forget that. They are far from infallible. See, our country was built around the idea of self-governance and independence. But 39% of Americans are on some kind of government program. One in six Americans are on direct government assistance. 50% of Americans, or 47%, do not pay federal taxes. In the last election, we had less than 58% 50, uh, turnout of registered voters. When you take the real numbers of the eligible electorate, 
less than a third, 29% voted for the president of the most powerful nation in the world. Is this America you want? It certainly isn't the America that Ronald Reagan envisioned. It's amazing when you look back into history at a small group of colonies united to fight taxation without representation. Clearly, it's evident now that we face the same challenge. This is a nation founded on the principles of limited government, individual liberty, self-responsibility, and a strong national defense. In 2008, Barack Obama promised hope and change. But all that he's delivered is doubt and division. He wanted change, all right, a radical transformation of our country, and he hoped nobody would notice. It's time to take our country back. Information is power. James Madison wrote, knowledge will forever govern ignorance, and a, and a people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives. It is the duty of edit good editorial cartooning to inform, but it's the job of the good citizen to be informed. You know, as I look back at this uh, book that I wrote, I think about this current presidential election. There's a lot of people out there that sound great, but you have to look beyond the rhetoric. This is a very, very serious election that's coming up. Uh, you know, the governor and I were talking about uh, Scalia's passing. You know, nine of the 13 appellate courts right now are run by progressive majorities. The only impediment to them legislating from the bench was a five to four, sometimes conservative majority. That no longer exists. And with the chaos around the world, it's not a nuclear Iran. It's the 13 other African nations and Middle Eastern nations that are pursuing nuclear technology today because of a nuclear Iran. Now, I don't think that a person that cannot delineate between radical Islam and Islam, illegal immigration and immigration, deserves to be president of the United States. This is a serious election with serious consequences. What I want to urge you to do is to take it seriously, to look on beyond the, the rhetoric and the sheen of celebrity. Look at these candidates for what they are, for who they are and what they represented in the past. Like Barack Obama, it's revealing. You'll find out who they really are. Look at their words. It's your job. It's your duty. And get engaged. This is your government. This is your political system. Take it back. I hope you find this book, at the very least, entertaining, but mo more so serving as a catalyst for thought. I hope it will inspire you to, to a call of action, a call to serve, and to get involved in the process of self-governance. Because who controls your destiny is up to you. You know, one last thing I want to talk about is I think we're sub subjected to three pillars of influence today. And we've talked about this, uh, Galen and the governor and I. You know, the first one being education. Progressives have taken over the institution of education. They're using it as propaganda to brainwash our children, and they reinforce these ideas in, in upper academia. You know, I'm a free market capitalist. You have a powerful weapon against these people. It's called your money. If you graduated from one of these institutions and they're doing it, don't give them money. Don't send your children to those schools. The second pillar of influence is popular culture. They are invading popular culture and supplanting our American ideas and morals with their own progressive vision. I have a good friend of mine, Mark Joseph, and John Sullivan, right here in the second row, who, who did the Dinesh D'Souza movies and, and Lots of other great movies. They're trying to fund the, uh, the new Reagan movie. We need to start making those investments. If you see a movie with moral clarity, support it. If you don't like a television show, write about it. Protest. And the last pillar of influence is the media. The media is doing an awful job. When an editorial cartoonist has to spell out the details of policy in a cartoon before Newspapers and reporters are willing to write about it. That is a shame. If you read something you don't like, write a letter to the editor. When a newspaper comes up for sale and you can afford to buy it, buy it. 
and then give me a job. <laughs> Hopefully these cartoons will inform you and inspire you to action. I'm going to show you a few here and uh, see if we can get it going. This is my book. I'm a capitalist pig, so buy it. <laughs> see, I'm going to have to figure out how to advance this. Oh, here we go. It's kind of remote. Oh, that's my favorite cartoon ever. <laughs> Did I go on the wrong? There we go. Investors Business Daily is my newspaper. Please support the newspaper. Go to www.investors.com slash cartoons. On uh, Facebook, you can like me at Michael Ramirez Political Cartoonist. And uh, you can hear my tweets at Ramirez Tunes. OK. Oops. Now here's a pic this is the reason why I love doing my job. Here's a picture of uh, President Clinton looking through binoculars. If you read the copy that's not coming up, it says the lens caps are still on. <laughs> I don't know why it's not coming up. See, I'm an equal opportunity defender. Here's President George W. Bush with his lens caps on. I think you're only going to see every other image. So, well, that's not working either. Here we go. Uh, this was one of the cartoons in my Pulitzer package this year. We don't have a complete strategy on ISIS, but ISIS does. Here is a President Obama racing our borders and the courts redrawing them. <laughs> and when President Obama is talking about Al Qaeda on the, is on the run, this is what he meant. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about uh, Hillary Clinton's email problems, and uh, you, your email problems are beginning to worry us. You've got jail. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes with, with political cartoons, when you think about it, it's like advertising. You have five seconds to capture the viewer's attention and five seconds to deliver a message. Sometimes just powerful images work. Here's the welfare state illustrated. You know, in California, you know, not only do we elect bad politicians, but we resurrect the bad, really, really bad ones. <laughs> I mean, you have Pete Wilson here. For goodness sake, if you're going to replace the governor, get a great governor. Instead, we've got this one, reservoirs. What California obviously needs are shorter showers and a high-speed rail. This reservoir is nearly empty. <laughs> and, and we figured out what they're going to do with that high-speed rail. They're basically going to transport water from Vegas, I guess, too. If we were aware of the evil back then, would the world have prevented it? You know, what makes me so mad about ISIS is that, uh, you know, I, I go to... to uh, Afghanistan and uh, Iraq on USO tours. I was there eight months after the surge in the middle of the war in Baghdad. I just went back there last October. I felt safer in the middle of the war than I did this last trip. Iraq is, is really uh, these towns that are separated by long highways. And we went into Iraq from the Ali Salim Air Base down in Kuwait, the most northern part of Kuwait. And as we drove to the base, we traveled on that 60-mile highway of death. If you remember during the first desert storm, they had asked the Iraqi troops to surrender, but instead they kept on raping and pillaging their way up north toward Baghdad. So we caught them out in the open on this highway and just obliterated them. The first image that I saw when I looked up ISIS <clears throat> was a decapitated eight-year-old girl in a Sunday dress. The president had access to much worse brutality, I'm sure. He knew they were coming in from the northern border, and yet he allowed these people to invade Iraq and take over the oil fields. <laughs> if you think you're safer now than you were before 9-11, ISIS has 35 to 50,000 troops that are rotating through the process of learning how to kill people and going back to their host countries. They have Western passports and American passports. 9-11 was 19 individuals funded by a few Saudi millionaires. ISIS makes about $1.2 million in revenue a day from oil revenue and criminal activity. It's time to secure our borders. This is on Caitlyn Jenner, The Evolution of Man. <laughs> 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 
President Obama taking to the cleaners. I think we got a good Iran nuclear deal in hand. The Planned Parenthood fetal harvest chart. On the Syrian refugees, refugee roulette. In Greece, with the fiscal responsibility arms missing. And that tragic case in San Francisco. Let's see if I can get to it here. Where the deported man was charged with murder. Sanchez's accomplices were a sanctuary city policy and an Obama immigration policy that allows these killers back in. And the, of course, uh, with ISIS, the Obama administration said it was because of employment that they became terrorists. I did this cartoon. I couldn't get a job beheading people in the private sector. <laughs> Here's the Clinton Foundation. <laughs> mutually assured destruction illustrated. Because mutually assured destruction only works when the other side doesn't want to die. Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> How dare you call us a do nothing Congress? Why I oughta? <laughs> Mr. President, you may not believe in radical Islam, but radical Islam believes in you. And the Paris massacre, the pen is mightier than the sword. The preservation of liberty. We're wrapping up here, so I, I don't want to take more of your time except to sell my first book, which you can't see. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has the right to my opinion. Let, let, me just, let me just show you a couple more because these are, these are fun. Now, they're not appearing. Oh, well. That's, that's a sign from heaven, I think. <laughs> This is a cartoon of Hillary's accomplishments. <laughs> Let me just quickly wrap up and say that, um, you know, I, I love America. I think America is the greatest country in the world. Um, it's amazing. It's an extraordinary country because of its extraordinary people. That's the one thing that Ronald Reagan knew. He knew that... Uh, that the extraordinary nature of our, of our country came from the people. <coughs> you know, America is a place where you have the freedom to succeed. It's a place where you can aspire to do anything and you have the freedom and the opportunity to accomplish your dreams if you have the will, the courage, the dedication, and the desire to do it. We've been challenged by the forces of evil. And I'm not just talking about Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. <laughs> But it's not in the nature of America to run from, from adversity. See, Americans will risk their lives for a great cause. And America is a great cause. You see, Mr. President, you're wrong. President Obama, America is not just one country among many, many countries. America is not a nation of entitlement. America is, is a nation of achievement. America is a nation of exceptionalism. I'm not ashamed to say it, or, nor do I feel the need to apologize for it. Mr. President Obama, America is the greatest country in the world. They may abandon the lexicon of combating terrorism and Islamic extremism. They may abandon our mission to spread democracy around the world. They can cancel the, the moon mission and exploration of other worlds, but they can't cancel your dreams. It's a dream our founding fathers endowed upon us by our creator. It's a dream of freedom and liberty and justice for all. It's a dream that Ronald Reagan passionately believed in. It's called America. God bless America, and God bless you all. Thank you for coming out. Thank you very much. Thank you.
ladies and gentlemen, Michael has agreed to sign books for us tonight. So here, we're going to let Michael go and get set up in our bookstore. Give us a few minutes to set up, and then we'll invite all of you to turn around and go through this doorway so that you don't have to go outside and get wet in the rain uh, if you would like your book signed. If you do not have a book yet...